talking here about the, the interplay between gene duplication and how networks evolve. And we focused on whole, gene du whole genome duplication in, in, in yeast, and I'll mention why. So this is work with my student, Yun Zhu, and my collaborator, Jing Wu Lin, at uh, Rice University. So just briefly, gene duplication, when we talk about duplication, it's about a segment of DNA in the genome being duplicated so that we have two, two uh, identical regions in the beginning. And uh, when that segment of DNA, this is just a mutational event, when that segment of DNA has genes in it, protein coding genes, then we have gene duplication as well. Okay? And this is believed to be a major evolutionary event in, in genome evolution as well as in network evolution because gene duplication or DNA duplication results in the addition of new DNA into the genome, but if it has uh, protein coding genes, this will result also in new nodes in the interaction network, in the protein interaction network, and also new interactions there. Okay. So there has been a lot of work on gene duplications and networks. Okay. This is just a, a sample of some of the papers, most of which focus on graph theoretic algorithms for reconstructing ancestral networks under gene duplication, under the assumption of gene duplication, or reconstructing the evolution of networks and so on. But this work is, is different from these uh, papers that have been published. Here we focus on understanding the relationship between divergence at the sequence level. Once the gene duplicates and then it diverges through evolution, how does this divergence, how does the accumulated divergence between the, the two copies, how does it translate at the network level? And the other thing, the other aspect of the work is that we look at, can we use the network topology, the interaction, uh, the interaction network topology, to try to understand the fate of these gene duplicates? And I will explain what I mean by, by the fate. Now, in this work, we focus on whole genome duplication in yeast. So what is whole genome duplication? As the name uh, says it, is the entire genome gets duplicated. So it's not just one segment of DNA, it's the entire genome gets duplicated. This is also called polyploidy as well. Now, why is it good to focus on whole genome duplication? Because for the analysis we want to do, the nice thing about whole genome duplication is that all the pairs of genes, all the pairs of paralogs that originated at this whole genome duplication, they all have the exactly the same time to their most recent common ancestor. So if I look at every pair of paralogs that originated at the whole genome duplication, they all go back about 100 million years ago. Okay? So we can rule out the time, the divergence time, as the, the factor that's affecting how things are changing at the network, and we can focus on other things. Okay. So yeast, it is known that uh, a genome of yeast had undergone uh, whole genome duplication about 100 million years ago. Now, if we look at the Saccharomyces cerevisiae genome today, we still have evidence of about 10% of these uh, whole genome duplicate pairs. Okay, so we don't, not every gene there is, has paralog. So about, if you look at the, at the Saccharomyces cerevisiae genome, there are about 550 pairs of paralogs that are, uh, that are expected or, or believed to be coming from that whole genome duplication event. So in this work, we focused on these 550 pairs of whole genome duplicates. We got the sequence and gene family data from the study of Butler et al. that was published in Nature in 2009. And for the protein interaction network, we looked at the yeast, inter the yeast PPI network from the DIP database. Okay? So the, the first uh, question we wanted to look at is the, the rate of protein-protein uh, interaction evolution. So what is the rate uh, at which edges or interactions between pairs of proteins come and go in these networks? Okay. So, just uh, recently, Teichmann and uh, Babu showed in, in 2004 that about 90% of interactions in the regulatory network of E. coli and Saccharomyces cerevisiae actually arose due to gene duplication. Okay. So there have been some work looking at this, at, at the, the role of duplication in the evolution of these regulatory networks. But the question that we were interested in is how does divergence at the sequence level affect the gain and loss of interactions? Okay. So in, in a more recent uh, work by Xian et al., they actually showed experimentally focused on 87 pairs of genes in two yeast species. So here in this study, they did not look at duplication. In fact, they made sure that they exclude uh, duplication, and they focused on pairs of proteins in one yeast species. 
that whose orthologs, one-to-one -one orthologs in the other species, are suspected to interact. And then they try to measure or estimate the rate of evolution of these protein protein interactions. And in this study, Sian et al. actually estimated that the rate, the evolutionary rate of protein protein interactions, to be on the order of 10 to the minus 10. Okay? which uh, per PPI per year, so per interaction per year. This rate is about three orders of magnitude, slower than the rate of, of protein sequence evolution. So here, pr the evolutionary rate of protein sequence evolution is measured in terms of the number of amino acid substitutions per protein per year. Okay? So it was found here by focusing on orthologous groups, or what the, the term has been coined in the literature as interlog, an interaction between two genes or two proteins in one species that is conserved in another species. So here they found again that the rate of PPI evolution is about three orders of magnitude lower than, than the rate of evolution at the, at the amino acid sequence level. But again, they focused on these 87 pairs and they looked at at uh, orthologs, and the question there would be that, you know, it's not easy to calibrate the times of these pairs, whereas in, in whole genome duplications, we can, we can calibrate this. So here we, com we try to complement the work of Shan et al. by looking at these WGD pairs, because we, again, we know that all these pairs originated at the same time. Okay, so I'm not going to show the derivation of this, but we focused on something here by looking at every pair of whole genome duplicates, G1 and G2 in this equation here. We focus on something that we call the shared neighborhood. So if you look at these two genes, at these two duplicates, and for each one of them you look at its neighbors in the protein interaction networks. And then the shared one, the shared neighborhood, is basically the neighbors that they share. And we normalize it. It has to be normalized by the, by the union of these neighbors. If you look at this at time t, so if, we, if, if you look at SH sub zero, this will be the shared neighborhood immediately after duplication. And this should be one, right? Because it is expected that when duplication happens, the sequences are identical, you, it, it makes sense to assume that they have exactly the same neighbors. So at time zero, this SH T of G1, G2 is one, but the question is that after T time units, what that value is. So here in this, uh, in this equation, or this formula, you have the parameter A which is the, the shared the neighborhood size at, at the, at immediately after duplication, and then we have two rates here, uh, mu sub L and mu sub A, which are the loss and gain of these protein, interaction, uh, protein interactions, and we have L and P, these are the sequence length and uh, the proportion of, of size that differ in each one of the, the protein pairs. So here we took this formula and tried to fit it to the data where we look at the normalized sequence distance here, so it's similar to the Hamming distance normalized by the length, versus this shared neighborhood size. And when we fit this, actually for these pairs, we find that the, the mu L and mu A, the, the rates at which we lose and gain these, these uh, edges, the, if we look at the mu L, time L here again is the length of the, of the gene, it is actually, if you, if you divide by L, which is on the order of 1500, or a thousand, you will see that you get actually a rate that is also three orders of magnitude slower than the rate of, of evolution at the at amino acid level. Whereas for the addition of edges, we are finding actually that the rate is almost negligible, especially for this data set, that the, the rate of addition of new edges after, this after, after duplication is very low. Okay. So again, our results agree with, with the results of Shan et al, by, but again, by using a very different data set and different uh, assumptions about the, the evolution of these proteins. And the second thing we wanted to look at is the fate of duplicates. Can we use the network topology to look at the fa what happens to duplicates? And what, what do I mean by the fate of duplicates? So after d d d gene duplication happens, now we have two copies, and these two copies start evolving independently and diverging. What happens to these? There are lots of theories or lots of classes of what happens to, to these uh, genes. One of them is called subfunctionalization which means basically that now the two copies together are going to be f are going to be performing the function okay this is known as subfunctionalization and we have new functionalization which means that one of the copies basically retained the original function whereas the other copy developed a new function 
And we have, of course, the loss of function or, or the gene loss here where one of the two copies loses its function and we go back to a single copy. This is not easy to deal with in our data set because if this happens, it's not in these 550 pairs because if the, if the gene function was lost, it's not going to be in this data set. So the question is, can we predict what are these fates? If we look at each one of these WGD pairs, can we predict or can we get a, an estimate of their fate for each one of the pairs based on the network topology? So we actually use the network topology as a proxy for this function. So if we look at, at this part of a network that's evolving, so we have this gene here that has four interacting partners, and then it duplicates, this gene duplicates. So immediately upon duplication, again, as I said, it makes sense to assume that they share exactly the same neighbors. But then they start diverging. Okay? When they start diverging, you can look at sub-functionalization, for example, from a network perspective, that together, combined together, they will share now the neighbors that they originally shared. If we look at neo-functionalization, you might see some disjoint uh, neighborhoods between them. But also, we wanted to account for a third possibility that you have really conserved function, that evolution, uh, duplication happened, and these two copies, both of them retain the original function. Again, as I said, uh, gene loss or non-functionalization, we cannot model it here because we have no evidence in the data. We cannot go back to that. Okay? So we wanted to, to try to estimate the gene, the fates of these gene duplicates from the network data. So we look at, we assume that we have this X, which is the, the normalized size of shared neighborhood immediately upon duplication, which we don't know. We want to estimate. And, and, and then we, we have these A and B, so we have the, the pair of duplicates. A is the, the, the normalized size of the neighborhood of, of uh, this gene, and B is the normalized size of the neighborhood of the other gene. Then if we look at idealized situations where sub-functionalization is really, each one of them is performing part of the function and in the network they are, they are combined to form the function, for example, we can say that A plus B equal X. Okay? Again, these are idealized situations. Of course, we don't expect these things, and we are not expecting them in the actual model. So you can model conserved functionalization, sub-functionalization, and neo-functionalization by looking just at these neighborhoods. Now, of course, when we look at the neighborhoods today, 100 million years after gene duplication, we have to account for mutations that happen at the, at the edge level or at the connection level. We do actually add these as parameters, and we devise a very simple uh, expectation maximization algorithm to try to, to learn these fates. We, we do this analysis, I'm going to skip this slide, uh, we do this analysis, we find that about 8% of the WGD pairs underwent conserved functionalization, about 20% underwent neo-functionalization, and the majority of the genes actually went, underwent sub-functionalization. We wanted to test if these, if these uh, results make sense. So we used data from this paper by Segre et al, where they used flux balance analysis to look at pairs of metabol at metabolic genes and see the effect of these metabolic genes on fitness of the organism, in, in, on yeast in this case. So what they did is actually they knocked out every gene individually. This is computationally in silico. And then they knocked out every pair of genes, and they used FBA to, to look at the effect on, on uh, uh, fitness. And then you can see that if, if the expected uh, effect on fitness by knocking out each of them, the, the product of that is equal to the effect on knocking out both, then basically you are seeing no epistasis. And otherwise there, there's epistasis. It's aggravating if the effect of knocking out both genes is much worse than knocking out each one of them individually and a buffering otherwise. So we use this data, but again, since they focused on only on metabolic genes, the intersection between their data sets and ours dropped down now to 182. So we have 182 WGD pairs that were also reported in that study. When we look at that, now we look at each one of these uh, groups of genes, pairs that we identified. We find actually that a lot of genes show no epistasis in these, which will be along the diagonal here. And for all of them, there is some evidence of aggravating epistasis. Only for sub-functionalization, we see buffering epistasis. So buffering epistasis, think about it as knocking out one of them. You might still have a backup from the other one. Okay. Again, the, the data here, by the way, is very sparse in the case of conserved functionalization. It's just we found about 10 pairs only. So this one is not very reliable to look at. 
Okay? So the, the last question I want to end up with, so we focused on WGD pairs. Is this going to translate into the small scale duplications, which are more common? And to, look, to answer that question, we actually looked at different, uh, different statistics or different properties of WGD pairs versus pairs of gene duplication in general. So we looked at the protein interaction degrees of these uh, pairs. We looked at the length of the genes and we looked at the expression level and fitness. And if, if you exclude just the gene length, if you look at all these, the distributions are almost identical. Okay? So we conclude from here that you can actually take these results and translate them to, to gene duplicates in general. So to summarize, by inspecting these WGD pairs, we find that PPI evolve at, at a rate that's about three orders of magnitude slower than sequence evolution. We find that you can actually use networks as proxy to, to estimate the fate of duplicates. And results I did not show that are in the paper that WGD pairs that evolve much faster, they seem to actually have lower expression levels and lower effect on, on fitness as well. Okay. So with that, I want to just thank the funding agencies, the National Science Foundation, the Sloan and Guggenheim Foundations. And I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you for the question. No, I'm not claiming I should, and I should have made it much more clear. I'm not claiming anything about the, the, the evolution of, of PPI protein interactions in general. As I said, as from the title I said, it is actually about looking at those that duplicated. And these rates that we are finding, so the, the interesting thing is that we find these, these rates for, again, these pairs of, of, of paralogs, again, that originated from whole genome duplication. We found it interesting that the results agreed with the other result that had nothing to do with gene duplication. Right. But yeah, no, I'm, I'm not generalizing this result to all about protein pre interactions in, in general or even in any in other organisms. Of course, this is, it will be interesting to carry this over to other organisms. But of course, we cannot use whole genome duplication in most other organisms. Thank you. Thank you.